Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 18, why you need to finish your PhD quickly. Now, I'm asked this question all the time by students. Surprisingly, or perhaps not, I'm also asked this question by PhD supervisors. So today we're going to provide 10 answers to that question. We're going to look at why you need to finish the PhD quickly this week and how you finish the PhD quickly next week. And I've got 10 tips and tricks for you, but I wanted to start this week with two stories to frame the seriousness of our discussion today. In one of my former jobs, I was asked to speak to a particular school in a university about the importance of finishing a PhD quickly. And the gig was from 4 to 5 p.m. So I trotted over to the lecture theatre at about 5 to 4. And when I walked into the room, I realised something very, very strange was occurring. Very strange. Never seen anything like it before or since. We had some men, older male academics, older male colleagues, all at the back of the lecture theatre, standing and with their arms crossed. I thought, oh, here we go, what's going on here? But then that was only one part of the weirdness. <laughs> the second part of the weirdness is that in the second, third and fourth row of the lecture theatres, sitting, were young women. Now... You know, I presented why it's important to finish quickly and how you do that and all that sort of stuff. So it was a real proactive, let me help you finish these students to completion. And sort of I did that and then basically the question time was taken over by these wonderful gentlemen at the back of the room. And the first question uh, that came from the gentleman at the back of the room was not really a question, it was a statement. And he spoke passionately about how fantastic it was to be a PhD student. And it really didn't matter if students were enrolled for five, six or seven years because it's such a great experience. And I was sort of a bit stunned. I was thinking, how am I going to address that question issue? And my brain's going... And then my eye flicked down to the second row of this lecture theatre. And right in the, in the middle of the second row, there was a young lass, her eyes really big, really big. And she looked straight at me and said, well, mouthed, help us. I never forgot that. Never forgot her face. She was a lovely lass, got to know her very well in the subsequent two years, and we got her through. But help us. Yeah. To give you the second story, I had a very weird, problematic, unsettling conversation with PhD students in a particular lab. Now, as we all know, the fastest completers of PhDs around the world are young men and women, young non-binary identifying crew, that are in a lab. They're the fastest completers. Well, not in this particular lab. So I interviewed the colleagues in this lab to try and work out what was going on, and the students reported to me that they weren't being allowed to finish. There was always another paper to write another paper to write because this particular supervisor couldn't attract postdoctoral fellows. So the PhD students had to be the cheap labor's labor to enable the paper mills. But also and further, because this particular supervisor couldn't afford technicians for the lab, the students also did the technical work for free. Okay, so there, there are two stories about students, supervisors, and candidature lengths. Supervisors certainly gain free or cheap labour during a higher degree program, and there is a major power differential between students and supervisors, and that differential can be exploitative. And that's why we have policies, <laughs> that's why we have procedures, that's why we have governance, that's why we have often charters around the world to ensure that rights and responsibilities are clear. Students gain from quick candidatures. In most systems, supervisors do not. So let's talk about you, you today, you. 
and why you as a high degree student, PhD, master student, need to finish quickly. And I'm going to be very, very honest today, no punches are being pulled at all. Remember, I've been working in universities for 30 years, right? Let's do this. Let's get you finished quickly. Let me talk about why you need to do this. Firstly, higher education is volatile. Supervisors leave, retire, or are restructured out of the organisation. And really successful tenured academics are leaving the sector or being pushed out of the sector. They're on a voluntary retirement plan, etc. Now, when I was first supervised in my research master's degree, as an impossibly young human at a very, very posh university. All the people that taught me through my undergraduate and my honours and my masters had been at the university for decades. And they could choose when precisely they would like to retire. Those days are gone. They are gone. And academics are leaving the system or being pushed out of the system on a daily basis. The number of forms I have to fill in to confirm a change in supervisory panels would make your eyes water. Therefore, please, don't walk into this candidature thinking the supervisors that are going to start with you are the ones that are going to end with you. You don't have control over this university sector. It is incredibly volatile. Therefore, you need to appreciate every single day of supervision knowing that it is the last. Okay, and while we're heading into full goth mode, <laughs> let's go for number two. Supervisors die. <laughs> right, this is a tragic reality that is rarely being discussed, but there's some interesting pieces of research literature that are emerging in this field that's noting the age profile of academics, but also the sickness and the health concerns of academics. It is very, very dangerous for students to assume that supervisors are going to be around at the start and at the end of the candidature. Now, let me tell you a story that I have never, ever told. And I want you to remember this and think about this when you're sort of going, oh, will I bother going to this meeting? Oh, I probably won't. So a student was enrolled uh, at one of my former universities. He was pretty under-motivated. He thought it was going to be okay. And of course, a PhD is never okay unless you do the work. And my late husband, Professor Steve Redhead, and I would see him every week. Well, we would try to see him every week. We would be present for the Skype meeting and we would never know if he would turn up, the student would turn up or not. Now, the problem with this story is Steve got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he died eight months later. But during those eight months, Steve was absolutely meticulous in fulfilling his role as an academic and a supervisor. And can I say, he kept his illness completely private. I was the only person that knew that he was dying. So during that period between his diagnosis and his death, he finished 10 PhD students to completion and three more finished in the two months after his death. Now, even though he was dying, he fulfilled his responsibilities. And there's something incredibly inspirational about that, I think. But for this particular student that sometimes turned up and sometimes didn't, unfortunately, during this period, he went through a six month period where he just didn't show up at all. So of course, Steve was getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and he continued to show up for these Tuesday morning meetings. He got himself out of bed, had a shower, had a shave, tried to eat something, tried to hold that food down and present for his meeting. So each week he was getting thinner, but he was present because he wanted to get this student through to completion. So Steve turned up one week for a Tuesday morning meeting. Once more, the student did not turn up. Steve was hospitalized later that day and he died on the Thursday. Now, the story gets even weirder from that. Now, he died on Thursday. I went to work on the Friday. I didn't take any time off because what was I taking time off to do? But that's something else we may talk about at another Outrider. But it gets weirder because the following Monday, this student sent an email 
to Steve and I, saying he was ready to get back into it. Now, of course, the email had yet to be closed. The human had died, but the email was open a few more days after his death. But he said, the student said, I'm ready to get into this thesis. Yeah, let's do this. So on the Monday, I had to tell him that Steve had actually died and that he had been at all the meetings the previous six months on Tuesday morning. Now, the student didn't know what to do with this information and disappeared once more. Can I say this story has an even sadder ending? A year later, a year later, the student reappeared saying, oh, look, I've moved cities, moved jobs, feeling really good. I reckon I can finish this off now. So once more, I started the weekly meetings on the proviso that he would present a full draft to me on December 18. He could then go on holiday and I would read that draft. So December 18 happened, no draft appeared, heard nothing at all. And then on my birthday, January 3, the student said, yeah, I'm out, I can't do this. Now I've told you this story for multiple reasons, okay? Firstly, there, you know, I know there's a lot of abuse of PhD supervisors, but can I say there are tens of thousands of cases of truly amazing PhD supervisors who have sacrificed their life to try and help students to completion. And secondly, please do not assume that the supervisor is gonna be available when you're ready. And finally, recognise, please, for me, if you're not serious in your PhD, please leave the program because the costs and the consequences on your supervisors are catastrophic. You need to finish quickly because it's about respect and it's about responsibility. Three, the dating of your literature review. Now, my first two points about why you need to finish quickly are all about your supervisors. And there's a reason I started there and focused there. And that's because the students that finish quickly have a continuity of supervision. The longer you're enrolled, the less likely your supervisory team will remain intact. But there's some very, very serious problems that emerge when you take a long time to complete this PhD. And the most significant one is that your literature review dates. So most students complete a literature review of some form in their first year. And that's great, but think about what that literature review looks like five years later. 5.14 million academic articles are published every single year. So the quicker you finish the PhD, the less updating you have to do on your literature review. Remember that you cannot prove a significant original contribution to knowledge through a dated literature review, or if a literature review has a chronological gap of four or five years. Now, this problem is even more serious with systematic reviews, which really do have to be timely. Therefore, finish quickly, because that means you'll have to do a lot less updating of your literature review. Four, if you delay, you may lose your original contribution to knowledge. Some disciplines operate in a really, really accelerated intellectual clock, I work in a lot of those, but engineering is another great example. Nanoscale science is another great example. Climate science, coastal science, a lot of areas of medical science. The clock is very, very quick. So if you delay, you will lose that crisp original contribution to knowledge. From that point, you're really playing catch up with scraps of originality that are left to you. Also, if you delay, you might actually miss the publications that have gazumped you. Trust me, there is nothing more horrific, and look, I'm getting emotional because I've seen this happen to students. There's nothing more horrendous that occurs than when an examiner has to notify a student that actually there are 30 articles that have gazumped them on their original contribution to knowledge, and they list those articles. So. When you claim your original contribution to knowledge, you have to work really, really quickly. And that prevents that heartbreaking moment of being gazumped. Right, five, the currency of the research. Besides losing your originality, you might also lose the currency of your research. You see, academic life has trends. It has fashions. And what is a policy flavor at a particular time 
changes very, very quickly. So while you may have preserved your originality, your currency in terms of national policies might be pretty well dated and dented. So changes in national policy happen with governments. In Australia, of course, we have three-year governments. So you can see the problem if you've got a five-year PhD and a three-year government, all sorts of problems occur. If you are working in a politically volatile area, which I work in, many of you work in, then we have to take this moment and we have to be of this moment. Okay, six, you are blocking the development of your next project. The PhD is the worst research you will ever complete. It is not the best research you will ever complete. It's your first research project. And by placing all this juice and energy and emphasis on this PhD, you're actually blocking the development of future projects. Now, I always use the example, and it's great, and I spent a lot of time in North America, big shout out to all my friends in Canada and the US, but I always love in the North American academic interview process, one question is always, so what is your second book? I love that question because they're going, okay, your first book is your PhD, we'll take that as read, well, let's see what you're doing next. Therefore, have a clear PhD with a start and with an ending so that you can get on with the next thing. Get on with the next project. Seven, your mental health. There are plenty of intellectual reasons why you need to complete this PhD really quickly. But probably the key personal reason is the mental health of PhD students. And this has now been studied. We've got some good, strong international longitudinal studies. So we know what's happening here. The longer a PhD goes, the more likely a mental health problem will emerge. The narrative is a clear one, colleagues. What happen, and I've, I've seen it and the research shows this. What happens is the scholarship finishes, the student moves from full-time to part-time, their time management is completely disorganised, money is tight, momentum is lost and mental health concerns emerge. That's what happens. And that's why to this day in a big hide of Piper. That's why I work my students incredibly hard in the first year. I really, really get them going because if students give everything in that first year, they're blocking all these problems that emerge later on in their candidature. Now, I recently saw a student six months into a candidature and I said, how's she going? How are we moving towards the confirmation of candidature? How's the research going? And she said to me, oh, look, Tara, I haven't actually started yet and I haven't met with my supervisor. Six months into the candidature and she, she wasn't worried. She needs to be worried. She needs to be really worried. The first year must be a flying start and that blocks all sorts of problems later on. The longer a PhD goes, the more your mental health will be impacted. Full stop. Eight, remember the cost to your family and friends. Now I know it's very important that we focus on the student and their mental health. But I also want to focus on your family and your friends because it takes a village to create a successful PhD students and a lot of people have to walk with you on this journey. Much of your family, much of your friend's life is on hold while you're doing this PhD. And most of us have caring responsibilities in our families, in our friends, in our communities. And focusing on a PhD can be an incredibly selfish act. It is worthwhile, it is fabulous, and it is very much focusing on the development of the self. But if your partner is picking up the kids from school, doing the bulk of the cleaning, doing the bulk of the cooking, they are parking their happiness to support you. And therefore you have a responsibility to work hard and to finish because in many ways you've got to repay that kindness, that gift, that generosity that your family and your friends have given to you. Now, asking another person to suffer with you for three years 
is okay because there's light at the end of the tunnel, three years we can do that. If the three years suddenly becomes six years, not only is your life stalled, but so is the life of your partner and your family. Six years of your life and your family's life. And speaking of cost, nine, living with very little money is not a long-term strategy. Here we go. Most PhD students live with little or with no money, and this is a tragedy, and wow, I, I wish this situation was different. But in these difficult financial times, we've really got to ask the difficult questions. What is the best use of governmental funding in health and education, in teaching and research? And the invisibility of PhD students means that mostly your needs are forgotten. You're just not visible in a policy environment, and that is a tragedy. But you can't live in this impoverished state for a long time. Therefore, budget carefully and please finish quickly and get on with your life. Again, the narrative is clear. The students that are on scholarship, yes, there's very little money there, but things get much, much worse when the scholarship ends and the money disappears. Budget carefully, work hard, finish quickly. And remember, I'm not some posh person, <laughs> posh person offering you advice here. During my master's degree, during my PhD, I didn't have the money to buy a cup of coffee at the university. I never did. I never bought a meal at a university. And to this day, and for my friends and students at Casarina, you've never seen me in the coffee shop. And I haven't had a lunch break in a university in the 30 years I've worked in a university. So the impoverished state that I lived in during my master's and my PhD has stayed with me. And to this day, I live a very, very small life and I save money. But if you have a scholarship, and please remember, most PhD students do not have a scholarship. You need to work hard, you need to finish when the scholarship concludes. If you think things are bad now, trust me, things are gonna get a lot worse when that scholarship stops. So please know that the economic restrictions that you've suffered through as a PhD student will leave their fingerprints on the rest of your life. It will transform your relationship with money. You need to know that. And 10, international competitiveness for work. About 40%, 4-0, about 40% of students who do a PhD continue to work in higher education after they've graduated. But that means the majority of students, about 60% of our students, go off into other industries throughout the economy. But we also need to remember that there is a sizable chunk, dependent on the university, but normally about 30% of students who are part-time. And that means they've never left work. So they've continued to be a specialist, a nurse, an engineer, and enrol in the PhD part-time while in full-time work. Okay. But for the people who do want to work in universities, you need to grasp the competitiveness of work at the moment. And really, it's not just the moment. Be, be really understanding of what's happened to higher education as a workforce in the last 20 years. COVID made it worst because of this incredible range of redundancies that move through international higher education. So what that means is fantastic people, truly brilliant people today are not in work. Our universities who can, can choose now who is appropriate for a particular job and there is a big field to almost all jobs. So let me tell you about the appointment process. I was the external on a panel four months ago when 93 people applied for one job and we had to get the shortlist down to three. So of the 93, the first cut, the first cut we made was all the people that did not have a PhD. And that included all the people enrolled in a PhD, all the people saying, I've nearly finished the PhD. The first cut was that group. So. And we still have about 30 left, can I say? So we then had the 30 that had completed their PhD. So 
why this is always the first cut in jobs is people like me who have hired hundreds of people over the years and have given people a chance. So it's set on their CV or their application, um, nearly finished the PhD, and so we take a risk. And what's happened in all of those cases where I've taken risks, I'm sure other colleagues have taken risks, is the nearly finished PhD ended up taking five years. And why that matters is that person can't supervise other people and that person is doing the research on their PhD and not the second book, not the next project. So a finished PhD applicant to a job will always be appointed over someone enrolled in a PhD. And further, we look at the time it took for you to do the PhD. Why? Because that's a proxy of your ability to abide by deadlines. If we can choose between people who took three years to do a PhD or five years to do a PhD, who do you think we're going to choose? Just, we've got to be real here. I know this is a stressful conversation. This really gets students going, and I'm sorry for that. But we've got to be real here. I'm trying to get you into work and get you finished. We are in competitive times. So let me tell you a story about my second job when I was a little person at Central Queensland University. Big respect to everyone in Rock Vegas, come on. Now, I completed my PhD in two years, one year full-time, one year part-time while I was in a full-time academic job at the Vic, at the Victoria University in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it was only a one-year contract. I was filling in for a bloke, and so I'd gone over. But obviously, through the second half of the year, I was having to apply for work because, you know, I was out of work. You know, 12-month contract, I had to apply for work. So I applied for this job at Central Queensland University. And I was shortlisted. And the two other people that were shortlisted were much, much older than me, 10, 15 years older than me. But I was able to get that job because I had compressed their achievements into a much shorter period. So I was seen to be efficient, a hard worker on a developmental arc, and I got that job. And to this day, to this day, because I finished that PhD quickly, my CV looks very different from other people's because it looks like somebody's CV that's 10, 15 years older than me even today. So my PhD was not an anchor or a sinkhole. Yes, I, I got three ones. I went straight through. Thanks for playing. Not a worry. No corrections. But it wasn't an anchor. It wasn't a sinkhole. My PhD was a springboard. I bounced off it. Remember, the PhD is not the best research you will ever produce. It is the worst research you will ever produce. Remember, the PhD is an act of learning. It is research education. And this is the foundation for your success, the foundation for your academic career. So for me, for your partner, for your friends, and most importantly, for you, for you, let's finish this thing quickly. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.